Hello church. Welcome to 1 Chronicles 26 and 27. Isn't 1 Chronicles just actually wonderful? Here we are again, lots of things we could park on. Here's a couple ideas in case you didn't get struck by these already. But right out of the gate in 26 verse 1, it talks about divisions of the gatekeepers. That's an interesting word because we know that according to verses like Titus chapter 3 that talk about um, to warn a divisive person once, warn him again, after that, have nothing to do with him. God does not want any division or divisiveness in his church. That we ought to guard against. And yet here we have divisions. But it's not like they are not being divisive in nature. They're actually working together for a common good. And so you can see in, they're, not, they're, they're two different groups of people. There's divisions of them or more than one group. And, but they're not pulling apart. They're actually pulling in the same direction, although there's more than one group of them. And so that reminds us of, of uh, passages in the New Testament like Acts chapter 13 that talks about how Barnabas and Saul were called. They were a separate division, if you will, but they were working together for God's glory. And um, 1 Corinthians 12 would talk about the whole body has many different parts, but they work together for God's glory. That, those kind of, those are like divisions that work together for one common purpose. And so they're already right out of the gate, the second word in this chapter we could already ask the Lord this question and say, Lord, am I working together with the other divisions of your church for your common purpose and glory? Oh, spend some time there with the Lord. And then I want to talk a little bit about this guy who uh, I would have a hard time remembering his name. If you look at chapter 26, verse 26 to 28, there's this guy named Shalomith. And he has an interesting responsibility, and I think it is really striking. So there has been a number of guys like King David, King Saul, commanders of the army, and so on, who have gotten things over time, and they have dedicated these things to the Lord. And this guy, Shalometh, his job, according to verse 26 and 28, is uh, he and his relatives are in charge of the treasuries of the Lord. These things that were dedicated to the Lord, they are in charge of making sure that those things get handled the way that they were intended to be handled. And I think that's fascinating. It's a, it's a large responsibility to make sure these guys obviously see that this guy is trustworthy. He's the guy who's going to make sure that although he's not going to steal it for himself, he's going to make sure that those things get handled the way that they were intended to be handled for, uh, be handled. And that reminds me of Jude verse 3 that says you and I actually have been entrusted with dedicated things as well. We have been entrusted. The saints have been entrusted with the faith. We have been entrusted with it to uh, make sure that it does not get tainted by sin or somebody kind of uh, makes it muddy or messy. We've been entrusted to diligently proclaim the name of Jesus and to keep his name as the one way to salvation and so on. It also reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul tells Timothy um, to entrust reliable people to teach what you've been taught and then to keep on uh, teaching what you've been taught. And again, it's people that have been entrusted to make sure that the definitions of sin stay the same, to make sure that Jesus Christ is the one name in whom we find salvation and the gospel message stays pure and so on. And so this thought right here out of First Chronicles 26 could make us think about a question like this and ask the Lord, Lord, Thank you that you would entrust me to take care of your dedicated things like the purity of the faith and salvation we have in you and you alone. And then just talk to Jesus about that. Ask him if, there's, if you're doing well in that area. Ask him if there's places where he would like you to, to shift into another gear and do even better. And so that is just an awesome thing already with the Lord. But then there's a verse in chapter 27 that I just think is incredibly striking. In verse 33, out of all the people in this chapter, it talks about officers, it talks about heads of families, talks about commanders of a few, commanders of more, and it goes, it even lists a whole bunch of them by name, the king's overseers and his counselors and all these kinds of things. And then it mentions this one guy, Hushai the Archite, and he says, this guy was the king's friend. And I think, fantastic. Listen, Hushai is mentioned in 2 Samuel chapter 15 to 17. And in that story, Absalom is coming up with a conspiracy to overthrow David's, uh, David and his kingship. And Hushai is known as David's friend. And David sends him back to Jerusalem. And when Absalom talks to Hushai, 
he says to him, why are you over here? You should be with David. Which is a fascinating thing because Absalom knows what we know is that friends journey in life together. They should be together, not apart. And so what a wonderful thing. You and I have an opportunity, and this might sound a little bit shocking, but you and I have an opportunity to be a friend of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Do we allow ourselves to do that? I know that might sound a little shocking to say, but listen to this. In um, James chapter 2, Abraham was called a friend of God. In Exodus chapter 33, God would speak to Moses as God would speak to him as speaking to a friend. And here's a fascinating thing. In John 15, Jesus talked to his disciples and it applies to you and me. And he said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Because a servant does, know, does not know his master's business. But I've called you friends because I reveal things to you and have revealed them to you. And so this is a question we ought to ask and talk to Jesus about. Jesus, am I allowing you to be my friend? I want to spend time together with you today. Church, because here's what a friend does. A friend spends time together with their other friend. They listen to that friend. They feel what they feel. They love what they love. And they learn to grieve over what grieves them. That's what we ought to do with Jesus. And we ought to spend enough time with him that we, it's like we become a confidant of his. He always remains the king. Just like to Hushai, David was always the king although he was his friend. Jesus is never our buddy, but he is our friend. Celebrate that today with the King of Kings and enjoy your day with Jesus.